we want the library to start first or? Yeah. Laura? You can take it away, Laura. Let me just unmute you here. It won't let me, but you can unmute yourself, Laura, and can take it away. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Grant, Grant. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I really miss our regular town meeting this year. Um, but I hope this finds you all well and safe. Uh, it's been a year of so many separations and so much uncertainty. It's been a year of disconnections. But through it all, our library has been here. Since March of 2020, our library staff of Sarah Montgomery, Wendy Makera, Tammy Johnson, rode the waves of the state guidelines, opening the library when they could, closing it when they needed to. Kudos to them for their flexibility, resourcefulness, and mostly creativity. They kept the library going in our community and they kept us connected. And kudos to our patrons who kept in touch, phoned the library, emailed, dropped finished books into the vestibule tote, picked up books and materials, which were all specially wrapped for you during the days when the library was closed. Maybe you were a patron who donated fabric for face um, for mask makers, distributed masks, or used one of the 500 mask extenders the library printed. Or maybe you were one of the folks who partook of the over 700 grab and go activity kits the library made available. Or maybe you were one of the patrons who downloaded ebooks, audiobooks during this long year. Oh, I lost you. Can you still hear us? Ye yes, I just see a lot of PDFs on my screen. Can you hear me? We can, hang on, I'm just sharing. Oh, that's the uh, library. Ta -da! That's our library poster. Neat. So this is all the statistics that Sarah kept. This is, uh, we know the library is an amazing place, but quantitatively, here's your documentation, here's your data that gives you an idea of how much happened this year, if you can all see it. Physical items circulation up 10%, digital items increase 47% this year. And last year it had increased from the year before. So our library keeps growing and keeps becoming more and more uh, important to our patrons. So shall I just continue? Certainly, I can keep showing this. Okay, um, all right. Um, I just, we'll do that when we get to the budget. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, over 65,000 ebooks and audiobooks were downloaded this year. Um, maybe you were a family who enjoyed story time and steam backpacks the library made. Or maybe you were someone who stayed connected through technology by the 24 seven free expanded Wi-Fi access outside the library. Or maybe you borrowed snowshoes for an outdoor adventure. So our patrons kept us connected. And I just wanna thank our hardworking board of trustees, Christina Bolduc, Peter Burns, Samantha Thomas for their patience and flexibility as we moved our meetings to Zoom in order to be transparent during this challenging year when we couldn't meet in, in person. Thank you, Susan Casavant, for agreeing to step in as our interim trustee to fill Laura Bellstrom's vacancy when she moved away. We are fortunate to benefit from both Laura and Susan's wisdom. And I wanna welcome and thank Jonathan LaBruere, 
our town administrator, who's become a valued part of our monthly meetings. Finally, I wanna thank Bridget Rivet and the friends who've been there for us during this difficult time and are already planning the next to bid or not to bid for September 25th. All of you, all of you have forged connections to nurture our community and our souls during this challenging year. As a well-known author, Toby Forward wrote, civilized nations build libraries. Lands that have lost their soul, close them down. So our library, Soulful, is alive and well, living in Fairfield, and we hope that um, everybody supports us on March 2nd, Article 5. Thank you. And Christina, is now going to discuss some of the finances. If I can pass that over to Christina. Yeah, Jonathan, do you mind sharing that again, please? Yes. And excuse my children in the background. So, so right financially right now, our budget for the library is $150,082 expected for this year. Um, we are asking the taxpayers uh, to vote and approve our budget and what we'd actually need raised by taxes is $103,632. Um, this is less than last year's tax request, uh, approximately by $11,000 because we had a surplus of funds due to pandemic closures, restrictions and fiscal restraint that happened throughout the year. Um, the other $46,450 um, our revenues are from grants, the tax rollover and funds for the endowment to help pay for the um, mortgage payment. And that is it. If anybody has any questions specifically about the budget or anything Laura talked about, the library is just presenting this information. So if there are no questions or questions, Jonathan, I hand that back to you as the host. Certainly. Tom, do you have anything else? Okay. So I'm not sure if folks have received their town report or not. They were mailed out thir Thursday? It was Friday. Thursday or Friday? Um, so folks should be receiving their, their annual town report um, very shortly. Uh, we did choose to switch to Australian ballot for this year due to um, the coronavirus and the pandemic. Um, but certainly please feel free to ask any questions. Um, I can give you the amounts. So the town budget to be raised in taxes will be $1,020,955. Um, last year's amount was $979,173. Uh, this is roughly a 4% increase in the municipal tax budget, uh, mostly due to the highway department increase in construction projects and adding gravel to the roadways um, but most of that increase is the, the highway department. Tom, um, do you have anything else you'd like to say? No. So if there, there, if there's specific questions, we're, we're certainly welcome. Um, we do have 45 minutes or so allotted for, you know, question and answer. So please feel free. Um, again, if you don't, don't mind just raising your hands. Let's see. So at this time, we'll, we'll open it up for questions and um, you can direct them to me or, or we do have three select board members on, uh, but please feel free to, to ask away. Support person is not here. What? I said our support person is not here. <laughs>
don't see any questions. Um, I guess if, if there are no questions, um, you know, we're, we're here. I got, I got a little one. Yeah. And I think I probably brought this up and uh, I, I limit my questions to things in my feeling, but um, there was uh, an increase in uh, ambulance and dispatch services. And I just wonder if, if you have a breakdown and which is which you divided that total. Not off the top of my head, um, but yes, I can. There is a breakdown, um, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Just the background on this M care ambulance, which serves Fairfield, has, has changed hands. That is correct. And um, it, I serve on the statewide EMS advisory committee, and this is the kind of thing. Uh, that I think is coming into Vermont and a lot of small emergency service units are having difficulties before COVID, COVID's made it all worse. Certainly. And I just wonder if, if that has to be monitored for uh, price increases in the future. And I know that this is really two separate questions. One is what does dispatch cost? Which is not a whole different issue. Yep. But, um, and and it, it, does anybody ask them? How do they come up with this? Is it per capita fees, flat fees, or negotiation? Yeah, it's a great question. I um, have it when they came to tell us, do you remember what it was? Because it's in the minute. I remember when Mo and um, I guess Taylor can remember. I can, I can go look it up. It'll take me about five minutes if you like. Um, I know that this batch did increase significantly um, this past year, and they, they said that a lot of that was due to technology, um, new uh, repeaters on Georgia Mountain. Um, but the, yeah, yeah the, this past year, the increase was was due to dispatching services. Um, was that, Jonathan, wasn't that separate from, that was, that was the police and fire, that was separate from EMS, correct? Or are they all together? No, that uh, they're all together under dispatching. So okay. uh, St. Albans Central dispatches our dispatching service, and they dispatch um, the EMS and fire. I believe state police is through a PSAP. I don't think they're dispatched through central. Um, but yes, that that increase was through central dispatch through St. Albans. That increase. So if there was an increase to the technology, does the fire department have they had good service with the? Uh, They'll be here at seven. Yeah. Okay. Dave's on now. Hey, Dave's on. I'm also a member of the fire department. Um, I haven't, I guess, noticed a difference, um, but you know we do get good reception. Um, I live in Fairfax, and I get my homes. Uh, through Fairfield, they come in very clear. Um, Can you identify who asked that question? Thank you. And what the question was, please. It was very hard to hear the question, please. Do you mind just coming forward? The microphone may appear, so. Oh. Uh, I think Tony can use this. The question was um, about uh, on page 17. I was asking about the increase in cost for ambulance and dispatch and with changes in the EMS system and the constant issue of dispatch, I was just wondering um, how that was negotiated. And um, Jonathan was saying that uh, the dispatch part had an increase because of technology issues. And I was hoping that if uh, we're paying more for that. Our fire department is better served, and just checking to see if they had any dispatch or problems like that. So, and what I is your name, sir? Patrick Malone. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. Jonathan's gone to look it up, so that we're I can, Mr. Malone. I can tell you there was no negotiation. Uh, the price was just brought to the select board with a description of why there was an increase. Uh, it was not up for negotiation. And, and I, 
I, you know, first of all, I think the folks that build and manage this budget in my 12 years here do a great job. And I don't mean to be nitpicking. It's more about yeah. the emergency services we need. So just a, a question. Um, is not is it not negotiable? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Or is that a neutral? I think what they did was they brought they brought if I remember correctly, I remember um uh now Sergeant Lamoth coming with former Sergeant Taylor and just explaining huh. why there was an increase. And I, I I remember being satisfied personally with um with their explanation of the increase. Um there were some questions asked, um, but I really I don't want to say our backs are against the wall because that's never a true and accurate statement, but uh, I felt personally satisfied with the description of why they were asking for the increase. So um, dispatching services went up from 18,400 to 23,400. So $5,000. Um, the last time that uh, Chief Taylor came was November 14th of 2018. Um, and at that time, Fairfield paid $17,784 a year or $927 per capita. Um, and I did reach out, I emailed um, the city manager, Dominic of St. Albans, kind of asking about that $5,000 increase, and I have not. Um, I did reach out. And I've, it was 5000 for each town within their range, correct? Not just Fairfield? Yes. I remember that. I mean, this just happened this past year, but I didn't I didn't ask other towns to see what their increase was. So I remember them being included, other towns being included. Whatever their service area was, each each town in that service area was also seeing an increase. Yeah, when Taylor came, when Taylor and Lamont came, they said every time was everything else. Okay, well, I just uh, may, maybe for for future budgets, um, I think it might be in order to keep track of this because those are both areas that um, you know there's significant changes coming, and I, I think to make it more understandable if you separate those I agree. things. I agree. Right, this this batch is really more of a fire department issue, and we don't want them to not be served with what they need. No. Um, and that ambulance, but you know, with this with the changes in the EMS system, uh, who knows where that's going to go? I suspect the price won't go down. I mean, if they're charging people a per capita or something, and keep in mind, you know, when it comes to EMS, um, if if you're covered by any kind of insurance, chances are that bill's paid for. And so the per capita on top of that means we're paying twice for the service. So we just have to be careful. Oh, oh. Good to know. For Amcare, we pay them for this year $3,243 a month is what we're paying you. 3243 So is it is it calculated on a, on a per capita? I believe so, yes. Okay. Yeah. And the dispatch we pay, you know, once a year versus the ambulance care, they send us an invoice once. Yeah. But yeah, cer certainly it's very simple to in next year's budget to break those two line items out and so that we can see what dispatch is and what ambulance service is. I'd be happy to help you with that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We would we would be happy to have your help. Thank you for the question. That was great. Uh, like Julie has a question. Yep. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so my question, well, first I want to thank Melanie Riddle for um, being a grant writer for the town for a number of years. Um, Absolutely. And um, I'm sorry to see her go. Um, and was wondering what the select board's intentions are, if they're going to be um, in support of hiring another grant writer, and I guess the library could chime in on this too. Um, and I can speak for the school and community center, but we really appreciated 
having someone there to help us, particularly with the intricacies of the grant writing process. Um, so I didn't know if the select board had discussed this and if they will um, be hiring another grant writer or who will be hiring another grant writer. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. We did briefly discuss this uh, at a few meetings ago. Uh, we are happy, we are lucky enough to have a gentleman who's now a town administrator who happens not to write grants as well, um, which has been a big bonus. I'm not quite sure we've made an offer to that individual, but um, it has been discussed. We most certainly need a grant, a grant writer. Um, when you look at the value, the cost of the grant writer compared to the value they bring us, it's a no brainer, right? Um, the value is pennies on the dollar. So uh, we definitely need a grant writer moving forward. I would agree with that statement 100%. And losing Melanie, not only as a grant writer, but as a, <clears throat> she's, uh, she's become a friend of mine. She's pretty darn awesome. And it was sad to see her go in that capacity. Well, Great. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't aware she was leaving, but I know she's been helpful to the library as well. Yeah. So it will be a loss for us as well. Mm -hmm. Well, th thanks. I'm, I'm glad you're in support. And, um, and I believe, I Julie, we split the cost, if I'm not mistaken. I think we all contribute yes. to the cost of the grant writer. We do, yeah, yes. and it's it's in the community center's budget, and I think the schools and libraries as well, if I'm not mistaken, yes. and, and the town as well. So the town, the library, the community center, and the school all contribute towards the grant writer. Excellent. Yeah. Hey, Toya Craftsman, is that a job you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know what he's doing. Yeah. You learn a lot, Toya. I don't know. I'll have to uh, I'll have to stew on it after this. So the the rec committee is going to take full advantage of Mr. Crossman's expertise. We can promise you that. <laughs> and the historical society too. <laughs> um, well, I guess since I'm. <laughs> Being uh, referenced here, I might as well go ahead and ask my question. Um, this is kind of related to, I guess, Article 4. Um, let me turn my video on here. So I, I was wondering if it was possible. I know some towns, um, people in the town can actually purchase, or not purchase, they can get uh, calcium chloride from the town. I know over the summer, there were times when I know a lot of, a lot of people are complaining about dust on the roads and whatnot. Um, and, and I know there's just, you know, sometimes the road crews aren't available and there's there's so many roads in Fairfield. So I don't know, is that a possibility um, or a way to work that into the budget where people can just go and pick up a bucket of calcium chloride and, and kind of, they can spread it themselves essentially with a sprayer in front of their driveways um, I don't, don't know if that's ever been talked about or considered. Uh, it's not ever been mentioned since I've been sitting. I believe, I mean, we'd have to discuss if it would, I don't believe it's harmful, correct? Like I, my first concern is that there would maybe be uh, not over usage, but misusage. Um, we just don't want people coming, grabbing and just spreading it, you know, like crazy and then having uh maybe some owners using it much more than they should or more often. I think we would have to have that discussion. Uh, the sand pile is that, you no, know, that's a different thing, but the sand pile is open to the public, but I've never heard anyone ask for that before, Tori. Um, it yeah. is a little more expensive than sand. So that would, that would yeah. be something yeah. that we would, I don't think it's a, a no, but, there's a there would be a little bit more to it than just offering access um mm -hmm. just for, for a few reasons but that's a great question and we can actually talk about that at tonight's select board meeting but you, i believe you're the in my for me personally you're the first one to ever asked that okay yeah and i'll, I'll try to find out what, what the, the towns were that actually did that because i i know it's been successful and 
I, personally, I, the road crews have been doing awesome this winter. Um, so I think it's putting all of us to shame as far as plowing our driveways. Um, <laughs> but the summer is a little bit of a bigger beast. So just maybe something to, if you guys don't mind talking about it and then uh, and following up if, if possible, it'd be awesome. Not a problem. Like we can talk about it tonight. We can bring it up. Cool. Charlie. Yes. Charlie, I have a I have a question. Hey Sue, how Just are, are you? I'm good. How are you? Amazing. Even better now that I get to see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I bet. So just as a point, are you guys allowed to speak um, in if select board meetings on items that aren't warned? Jonathan. On the agenda? John, Jonathan, just that's curious. a Jonathan question. So no decisions can be made regarding anything that's not on the agenda. That is correct. But it can be discussed. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly bring it up. Um, you know, I can put it under my report or the highway foreman's report, but Sue is correct. Um, no decisions can be made unless it's on the warrant agenda. But it, it's open for discussion, just no decisions can be made. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. I don't see any other hands. Are there any other questions? Jonathan, it's Christina. I'm just curious on Article 4. I know Tori just mentioned it. It's moving to the, it's being requested to be moved to the town equipment fund. Is there something specific in mind or are we just looking at the TAD, TAD budget? Excuse me. Sorry, that, that's my team. That was awesome. That was great. Sorry, I, I didn't catch that. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, I was just asking if there was, you got him? I was just asking if there was a specific intent for moving 113000 to the town equipment fund for something specific to purchase, or if it was just that's low and we're putting it there for. So there was two purchases that came out of the town equipment fund this year that were pretty hefty. Uh, one was the sidewalk plow for our new sidewalks in Fairfield Center. And the second one was a new tandem truck that the highway department purchased. So yes, after those two purchases, our equipment fund was getting low, which is why the thought was to, to go with that fund to, to apply the surplus. Thank you. Absolutely. Are there any other questions? And I'm not seeing any hands. Would Dave or Jean, Charlie, Tom, would you guys like to, to say anything? Uh, the only thing I have to say about the car, I think there's a liability with a 5,000 gallon tank. So I think that, that would be uh, issue we did really have to talk and, and see what goes up with that. Yeah. And certainly our, our highway foreman is not here, so we will certainly have to you know speak to him and, and get his input on that as well. Uh, I could talk the only thing I would have Jonathan would be as the rec committee, not as not not as a select board member. Uh, just, just some, just some up updates with the uh, rec committee. Um, we had a very successful Halloween gathering where we did a drive-through Halloween. Uh, we had over a hundred, we had over a hundred cars and two hundred kids come through, which was really nice to see. Um, it seemed to have, it was received pretty well. Um, we had another holiday drive-through uh we had 
um, like we did what we could as far as um, the holiday season with drive through and blow ups and and such. Uh, we are planning a holiday carnival, which is actually happening right now. If you go on the town of Fairfield's website or our Facebook or the rec committee's Facebook page, we're trying to get kids active over break where they can do different activities basically with a checklist. And if you get the checklist done, um, you, you get into an enter for a raffle, which has gift certificates from most local businesses, some local honey, some local syrup, um, West End pizza, stones, uh, everybody in town is kind of offered that up. So that's kind of nice to get you know, we've, we've had some challenges with COVID as everybody has. I know library most certainly has felt that as well. Um, and it's, it's been challenging to become creative and get people active and out um, while obeying the governor's you know, regulations. So we're really trying hard to not make an effort because we've always made an effort, but really try to get people active in the community. Um, under these current guidelines and restrictions. Um, other than that, we've recently met with Tori Crossman and the Historical Society about uh, joining together and taking over the common school space, um, which is a beautiful building, um, which we'd love to see kept active. Um, there's a lot of work that has to go into that before anything you know, concrete happens, but the discussion has begun. Uh, the school is completely out. We've looked at the space um, and together, I believe collaboratively, uh, we're really hopeful and uh, would, should have a presentation put together to offer the select board to see what they think. Um, Cause it's just too, it's just too darn cool of a building to see sit there and not be used. It really is. Even though I, I am scared of it at night um, cause it is haunted. And I really don't feel comfortable in there at night and I will never be alone in there after dark. But other than that, the building is fantastic. Um, and we're just uh, looking forward. We have begun discussion about um, maybe pond hockey, but we have to look at the governor's guidelines to what that would look like. And if we thought we could actually pull something off without putting anyone in, in danger or jeopardy, of course. Um, but pond hockey is an old Fairfield classic that's we haven't really done much with lately. Um, it is outdoors, so we just we have some things we need to check out before we can offer that. But that is on our radar. Um, as the state moves forward with the rail, um, with the rail trail, we I've looked in the bike rent not rentals but bikes to, you know, like we do with our snowshoes at the library. We've talked about bikes having people explore our rail trail, and uh, we have. A lot of great ideas. Um, it's just not as easy as it once was, unfortunately. So um, if anybody has any input, we do meet the third Tuesday of every month. Uh, you can join us virtually, of, of course, at 630. Um, and we're hopeful maybe the next, not this month, but the next month, we might, we might be over at the common school. We'd love to have you over. So that's it for the rec committee. Well, kudos to you for getting people out. That's, we're trying. Oh, we're that's trying. so important. We are trying. It's been a tough year for that. I mean, it's the second second winter we've lost, you know, and um, where we live in Fairfield, winter sports and, and winter activities are big, right? Yeah. There's not a lot to do. So getting the people out and active is very important. And it's just been a challenge. It, it really has. Um, you know, we... We're not able to offer recreation basketball this year. Uh, the school um, views us as an outside organization and they are not allowing outside organizations to use their buildings. Um, we did go back and forth with Maple Run a little bit. Um, I was a little upset, I'm not gonna lie. I took being called um, an outside organization very personally because the kids that are part of the Fairfield Rec all go to the Fairfield Center School. Um, and they're in the building on a weekly basis. And I had a hard time with that at first, but unfortunately we were not given permission. So this is the first time I've been in this town for 14 years. It's the first time we haven't offered recreation basketball in 14 years. And it was a little disappointing to say the least. But 
we are trying where we are. And I know, uh, you know, we see what you guys are doing. You know, it's, um, we'd love to continue working with the library. We have started a relationship with, you know, Tory and the Historical Society. Our relationship with the East Fairfield Community Center has been great, especially with the run for chat. Um, kind of feels nice getting people together and organizations and committees working together in the town. It, it, it feels pretty good, I'm not gonna lie. Good. Well, I'll kind of springboard off with Charlie. So we'll go from one bald guy to another, I think. Um, <laughs> so I, I, speaking for the, the Historical Society, so we are excited to kind of revamp it. Um, Julie Wolcott and Melissa Manson and a few others did a great job um, yeah, before it kind of it kind of fizzled out, I think, around 2003. Um, but they, they set up a lot of good stuff. So we've been working on kind of getting that arch archived. Um, we're hoping to get it all digital. So we're hoping to have it, all, all the photos and artifacts, um, all online for, for kids or researchers to kind of pull up real easy. Um, we're also trying to kind of, you know, obviously cooperate with the rec committee, um, with the library and with uh, Jamie Tibbetts at the school. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously they do Project Sweet Talk and, and they've got, I don't know how many years of, of interviews with sugar makers and um, so we're, we're hoping to get some of that and we can uh, catalog that and kind of digitize it as well. Um, and then we've also had some meetings on, on long range uh, events essentially. So two of the, the main events we're kind of planning for right now, we, we'd like to do a ice harvest. Um, basically, you know, the, the way they used to harvest ice um, to keep the milk cold and food. Um, we're, so we're kind of looking at that on Fairfield Pond. It would probably be next winter due to COVID. Um, but we're hoping to work with the rec committee and others on that so that we can get kids outside and, and cutting ice and, and pulling it and we can have, you know, ice fishing lessons and, and a few other things. Um, and the other thing is I've, I've been talking to Tom Murphy and the owner at, at the Cloth Year in St. Albans. Um, they're kind of co-owned by Twigs and we're, we're looking to do some historical uh, lecture nights at the speakeasy. So um, you know, basically people can dress up 1920s garb and we're going to give them some articles from, from Fairfield and Bakersfield um, about the Prohibition era. Um, actually, there's, you know, two Prohibition eras essentially. So, um, so that's one of the events we're going to look at kind of opening up once, once COVID dwindles down. So, um, but overall, we're really excited to be working with everybody. So um, it's been great having, having a, a, a library already well established and underway and a rec committee that's doing a great job so um, it's been easy for us to kind of step in and come up with ideas so um, look forward to, to working with everybody well welcome thank you and i i would say the um school has always done a great job with their um their project sweet talk uh mm. program that they do every year some of it was um includes like um oral histories from a bunch of townspeople and mm -hmm. which I think is cataloged you know with pictures and their stories but it would be great like I just think about my father-in-law who's was born on the farm that he still lives on who just turned 94 and I understand you know he's had some health issues lately but um, I think it would be great to get oral histories from these folks that are Absolutely. still here because um, because um we're because it, we'll lose this if we don't do it now anyways that makes yeah. sense i'm excited for yeah, the absolutely. historical society yeah absolutely and um jamie Tibbetts at the school is i think she's working on getting permissions from some of the kids um who conducted the interviews so that you know we have permission to put their their videos on youtube or however we we digitize it so um that is a work in progress so um but the material's there which is awesome so thank you that's Next. wonderful. Do you have an update, fire department, Tim or Dave? Yeah. Wondering about the roof or something. Yeah. Absolutely. Dave, do you want to touch on the pop-ups and, and things of that nature? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gene? <laughs> Anything? Wake up, Gene. 
We're having difficulty hearing you. <laughs> he didn't say anything. Um, I guess I, I can go. Um, you know, I just want to thank you know the select board committee. Um, today is my the so anyhow, I'm sorry. I was on. The, I couldn't get into the meeting, so I had to call. Everybody, please Everybody. mute your microphones if you're not talking. Okay. That's better. All right. So again, I just want to say thank you to again all, all town staff and boards and residents. Um, today has been one year that I've been with the town of Fairfield, and it's been tremendous. Um, we've accomplished so much in one year during this pandemic. So you know, thank you again for everyone for your support um, and for working with all of us to to really make Fairfield a better place for us all. So again, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We have a message. We have about 10 minutes left before the, the second part of the meeting. Uh, just so folks that are um, on the meeting are aware, uh, VTrans will be giving a presentation at seven o'clock uh, regarding some work on a bridge um, on Route 36 near the Fairfield Market, and that will take place at seven o'clock. Um, but are there any other questions related to the town meeting, uh, public information, um, any questions for select board members? Again, we have about 10 minutes left um, to field questions. I might have another one. Of course. What are the Cat Crusaders? Article 11. They um, help round up and get feral cats spayed and neutered. So they've done a, quite a few farms in the area, and that's what they are, cat crusaders to spay and neuter feral cats to... Was that the same organization that was here a few years ago doing that? They hadn't asked for money before, but yeah, they've been around for a while. No. No, it's Jamie Rushford out of Enosburg is one of the key participants and she goes out, traps the cats and organizes, you know, the transportation and getting everything taken care of. Great idea. I guess I'll, I'll give one more shout out to Amanda Forbes. Um, you know, Amanda, through this past year has been instrumental um, in working with me in, in allowing a seamless transition uh, from one position to another. So um, I, I know she's not on tonight, couldn't be here, but um, certainly want, want to give a shout out to Amanda for all her hard work. There any further questions? All right. Well, hearing none. Oh, Laura. Yep. Go ahead. Do you have to unmute, unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, just a question. Um, so I asked you about how to get um, a mail-in ballot and then I called Linda and she suggested I email her. Is there uh, information out to the community for people who would choose that option? 
Can we hear you? There one spot. It's the same as it's always been. If people call in or um, and request one, we or come in the office. There is a form actually they, that we ask to fill out from the Secretary of State's office. However, it's no different this year than any other town meeting. People have requested um, absentee ballots every year since I've been here. Uh, so it's it's just uh, if they want one, they can request one, and it will be mailed to them. In the, in the deadline. Well, I mean, we have to have the ballots back by town meeting day. So if somebody wants one mailed to them, they can't. You know, they got to call. They got to let us know in the next few days, or else it's not going to get turned around in time. Yeah. So if we do mail folks ballots, or they do request an absentee ballot, they're due back to us by 7 p.m. of town meeting day. Um, and, and the polls will be open here at the town office building from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, for voting. Okay, thank you. Does that, does that answer your question, Laura? Well, I'm just thinking everything is so mishmash this year. And in the past, people could come to the school and vote. And this year, for a variety of reasons, people may not be comfortable going to um, the town clerk's office to vote. So I was just wondering if there was any particular information disseminated to the community about that option. So I posted information regarding tonight's meeting, but I, yes. I posted information regarding, um, you know, how to request an absentee ballot or of that nature. Again, certainly please feel free to reach out to us and we can get folks absentee ballots. Um, but the challenge is if we have to mail them to a place that, that's not local um, in the timing that it'll take to, to get the ballots to and from. You can put it on the one. But yes, I, I will post something first thing tomorrow morning, Laura. Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? And I see Laura Stone is on from VTrans for our next meeting. And la last call for questions related to the public information hearing for town meeting day. If there are no Questions, I'm going to bid you all a good night. Thank you all. Thank you all for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Have a great night. You too. All right, folks. So we'll just take a, a five minute recess before our, our next presentation. Okay, well, it's, it's now seven o'clock. We're going to start the regional concerns meeting. Um, I'll let Laura introduce herself. Um, and feel free, I might have to give you sharing permission. I have no idea how to do that, but we will. More. If you go to her, yep. click on her little dots. Yep. No, well, yeah, click on her little dots and yeah. on her dots. Not letting me. Well, there you go. Make host. It should have a make choice. So she'll just have to give you back hosting when she gets Shut up, man. Listen to me. Just shut up. Uh, I want you to fuck you up. Yeah. Oh. And protect your waiting room. Yep. Okay. Laura, take it away. Thank you. Let me go ahead and hopefully everybody can see my screen here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so welcome. This is the regional concerns meeting for the Fairfield uh, Deck Print 51 project, Vermont Route 36, Bridge 6 over Fairfield River. Um, Rob, you talking about? Let me see if I can mute some users. There we go. Um, so Rob Young is going to be the VTrans project manager. I'm the VTrans scoping engineer. Really the purpose of our meeting tonight, we wanna to provide an, an understanding of our approach to the project. We wanna provide an overview of the project constraints, discuss uh, the alternatives that we considered in the scoping report, 
as well as our selected alternative and really provide an opportunity. Up, Laura. You listen to me. You talk too much. So provide an Let's see if I can mute somebody here again. So provide an opportunity to ask questions and voice concerns. I will ask that people hold off on comments and questions till the end here. So here's a location map here. Uh, the bridge is located just to the east of North Road. In an aerial view. You're probably familiar with the bridge. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. You can't anymore because you made her the, I made her the, host. the host. So what you need to do is tell her how to do it. So, so we have to enable the waiting room or something, right? And well, you don't have to enable waiting room, but you can uh, disallow people to unmute themselves. Yeah. She you can mute everybody. That. So I did, I, I removed a participant. I hope that's okay. I'm not sure if that's allowed or not. Yeah. But. It, it is today. Okay. Sorry about that. So here's the an aerial view of the bridge. I'm sure you're familiar where it's located. It's located right at the United States, uh, United States Postal Service, um, the Fairfield Market and this gas station right here we also have the fire department just to the east of the bridge over here uh, this is probably a good time to point out we're aware there's there's a lot of schools in the area there's the fire department town um, town offices in the area places of worship businesses there's uh, a lot going on in the area here kind of a busy busy place so first, I'm going to briefly talk about the VTrans project development process. Next, uh, give a project overview. So talk about the existing conditions of the bridge, uh, the resources present, um, the alternatives that we considered, and ultimately our selected alternative. I'm going to talk about the maintenance of traffic options that we considered and what we ultimately selected. A schedule, so when you can expect to see the project in construction. A summary, and then questions again at the bottom. So here's the VTrans project development process. This slide is really just to show that we're at this really early stage of project development. The project's been funded. We're, we're just ending this, uh, this project definition phase. This is where we identify the resources, you know, the environmental, the cultural resources present, the constraints around the bridge. We evaluate alternatives. We have this participation piece. Shut up, Laura. We listen to her. I hear too much project. Uh, ultimately, um, we want to build consensus towards, um, towards our recommended scope. At the end of this process, we're at project defined. That's when the project is going to go into project design. That's when we're going to start quantifying the areas of impact, start the environmental permitting process, uh, the right of way process if needed and develop the plans, estimates, and specifications. Then a contract will be award and the pro awarded and project will There we go. Um, so before I move on, um, just some descriptions of terms that we use. The bridge deck is the part that is the riding surface that you ride over. Next, we have the beams or the superstructure is what holds up holds up that deck. And then the supports of the bridge, we, a lot of times we refer to those as the abutments or the substructures. Here's a picture looking west over bridge six. The road is classified as a major collector. It's an 89 foot long single spanned roll beam bridge owned by the state of Vermont. So those, there's no local funds here. It's 80% federally funded, 20% state funded. It was constructed in 1955. And again, like I already mentioned, the United States Post Office and the gas station market is located in the Southwest quadrant, really close proximity to the projects. So here's a picture looking east over bridge six. Uh, there are aerial utilities located in the project area. 
Also the Fairfield Town Garage and the fire department are located 0.2 miles to the east on Route 34. So existing conditions, uh, the, the existing deck is in fair condition. It's approaching poor condition. Uh, there's extensive saturation throughout with uh, map cracking and, and chunks of concrete falling out. Uh, additionally, there's a one foot by two foot full depth hole that's developed in the deck. So it is a really approaching poor condition. The existing beams, uh, Overall, they're in satisfactory condition. They do have moderate paint distress with rusting. And um, it's especially bad at the, at the beam ends where there's some infiltration with leaky points. Uh, the reinforced concrete curtain wall at abutment, abutment two has a full height vertical crack. And again, there's a full height vertical crack um, at abutment one in the back wall. So here's a picture of the bottom of of the deck. So the deck is rated a five fair. You can see there's a lot of cracks here. There's that, that full depth hole that's developed, some exposed rebar. Uh, the superstructure or the beams, those are rated a six. They're in satisfactory condition. Or, and the substructure or the, the supports at either end of the bridge are in satisfactory condition. Here's a picture of the northern abutment. I think that's that you can see in this picture, there's that, uh, that crack that I mentioned. Again, the southern abutment, you can see there's, there's a crack, but overall satisfactory condition. Uh, these are really stable foundations. They're on this, uh, they're poured right on this sound bedrock here. So we don't expect a lot of movement with those substructures. Again, the underside of the deck. Uh, the railing, there is quite a bit of section loss in, in, in the old railing. You can see it's, um, there's not a lot of, of metal left there. Uh, resources, so here's a picture looking downstream from bridge six. Uh, again, there's bedrock outcrops all throughout the channel. Uh, we do have hazardous waste located uh, in close proximity to the project. I believe that is the gas station. Uh, there's an archeologically sensitive area in the Northwest quadrant, which consists of mill remains. Uh, this is important for wildlife habitat. We have Northern long-eared bat habitat, and that really just restricts um, what time of year we can do any tree cutting. And there are historic resources. So the residences at 4775 Route 36, the residents at 4620 Vermont Route 36, and the post office are considered historic. So here's a layout view of the existing conditions. So this gray section right here, hopefully you can see my pointer, that's, uh, that's the existing bridge. These red lines here, that's the existing state-owned right-of-way. Uh, here's the gas station in this section. I'd like to point out these little red boxes here. There's some, there's some uh, utility pedestals located there. They're pretty, pretty substantial. So design criteria and consideration there's an average daily traffic of 2,000 vehicles per day, a design hourly volume of 260 vehicles per hour. So that's your peak hour of traffic. You would see 260 vehicles in that hour. And a percent trucks of 11.4. So the alternatives that we considered in the scoping report, um, we looked at no action, but obviously with the condition of that deck, there is additional maintenance required in the next 10 years. Uh, next, we looked at a minor rehabilitation. So that would just be removing um, any deteriorated concrete, uh, re reforming it and uh, patching it with new concrete. And we would expect about a 15 year design life out of a minor rehab. Uh, next, we looked at a deck replacement, uh, both accelerated bridge construction and we looked at a conventional type deck replacement. This would include a new deck, 
uh, poured on the existing beams. Uh, new bridge railing, it would have an 11-3 typical section, which meets the minimum standard and uh, matches the existing conditions out there right now. And we'd expect about a 30 year design life out of a deck replacement. Next, we looked at a deck replacement with beam painting just to address the, the issues with the beam flaking off, especially on those outside beams. Um, so this would be very similar to the deck replacement. It would just include the beam painting. A lot of times that's really expensive just because of the lead abatement uh, issues. And so beam painting can be quite expensive and really doesn't give you that much more design life. And we also, we also considered a superstructure replacement here, which would replace the, the deck, the railing, and the beam. So everything above those, uh, those abutments or the supports. And we get about a 40 year design life out of the superstructure replacement. Um, ultimately, we, se we selected a deck replacement here. Um, this would be replacing the existing deck and railings. We'd match the existing typical section, which is uh, two 11 foot travel lanes with three foot shoulders. Uh, we're gonna be designing this to, this says 40 here, but it is 30 to 40 years. Right of way potentially needed for uh, guardrail replacement. So I'll explain that in the next slide. So here's the proposed typical section. Again, that's that those 11 foot travel lanes with a three foot shoulder. And the proposed layout. So it looks uh, very similar to existing because we're just taking off the existing deck and putting an existing deck back or putting a new deck right back in the same footprint. Um, there is, and of course it's not shown in this picture, but there's the potential for a bit of right of way right here in this quadrant, um, just for the guardrail terminal. We put a flare on that guardrail terminal. So it's potential for a, a small sliver uh, right in this bottom right quadrant here. So it have an 11 foot, three foot typical section 30 to 40 year design life. There's the proposed profile of the bridge. Um, so this is a picture like if you're standing in the stream and looking through the bridge. Um, we're really just, just gonna match the existing vertical alignment. And maintenance of traffic. So we considered an offsite detour, a temporary bridge and phased construction. Ultimately, we selected a road closure here. We're proposing a 21 day road closure uh, signed, uh, chosen and signed by the state of Vermont. Uh, the regional detour route does have an end to end distance of 40 42 miles, and there is a local bypass route available. So this would be the signed detour route that the state would sign. Um, it would be Vermont Route 36 to Route 104, to Route 105, and 108, back to Vermont Route 36. Does have a 14.6 mile through route. So that's from one side of Vermont Route 36 to the other side, that's that 14.6. There's 27.1 miles as the detour route. Uh, for an end-to-end -end distance, so end-to-end -end is if you're going from one side of the bridge all the way around the detour to the other side of the bridge, that is 42 miles end-to-end -end, and added miles of 12.5. I think it's worth mentioning there is a local bypass route available. It's not, um, it's not paved. I'm sure it's posted for, for 24,000 uh, pounds. Um, but this is Vermont Route 36, the North Road, Chester A. Arthur Road, and Ryan Road, back to Vermont Route 36. This does have an end-to-end -end distance of 8.5 miles, and according to Google Maps, takes 14 miles to drive. So some uh, preliminary project schedule. Uh, right now, we have this in our spending, in our budget, for the summer of 2024. There's a total cost estimate of approximately $1.2 million. 
And a summary. So a deck replacement with traffic maintained on an offsite detour will be replacing the existing deck and the railings. We are gonna use something called partial depth precast deck panels. Um, so with typical cast in place concrete, we, we would expect about a 45 day bridge closure. So we're using this, um, this partial precast concrete system so we can reduce that closure time down to 21 days. We're gonna have a 11 foot, three foot typical section. So that, um, that rail to rail width is gonna match what's out there right now. It meets the, the current standards for safety and service. 40 year design life, a small amount of right of way may be needed for, for guardrail replacement as discussed. Um, impacts to utilities and additional limits outside the right of way that, that would have to be um, acquired if we placed a temporary bridge are avoided with a bridge closure. And again, we have a construction year of 2024. Um, so before I open it up to questions and comments, I'll just, uh, I'll note this website here up at the top and the town does have a copy of this website. Um, all future plan submittals will go up, up on that site. Um, tonight's presentation is up on that site. Um, so you can track the project there. So I guess I'll open it up to questions and comments at this time. Laura, with with the project starting um, roughly three years from now, you feel confident that the bridge will withstand that type of time frame before construction can begin? Uh, sure, I, I do believe it will. Um, it's still inspected on a regular basis by our bridge inspectors. If something is found um, that needs to be repaired, then then our bridge crew would would go out there, okay. and if we needed to put a plate out there, um, they would go and repair it and patch it up in preparation for the for the deck replacement. Well, Laura, that's an annual inspection. Oh, so when the substructures are uh, or when the components are rated a five or above, I believe it's a biannual construct a biannual inspection. Once components are rated four, so poor or lower, then it, it becomes an annual inspection. Certainly, you know, our district staff are driving over this bridge all the time. Um, if they find something, they reach out to the bridge crew. A lot of times, if a member of the community, you know, if there's a big pothole that forms or something, they will reach out um, to our bridge inspection crew or the district staff, and we get somebody to go take a look at it. So it's biannual now, but it will be annual probably by next year or the year after. It could be. It could be, certainly. And, you know, when we debated, um, looking at phased construction so we could keep traffic open versus uh, a bridge closure here. That was one of the components that we looked at was just the existing condition of the bridge. And we were worried about the integrity of the deck when we saw cut right down the middle of that to maintain traffic on one side. And that definitely played into our, our ultimate selection of the of bridge closure. Is there enough area in there and around there to be able to do a temporary bridge? I think I heard that. Sorry, it was a little. Did well, you ask about uh, is there enough area for a temporary bridge? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so I actually I I did bring up put some rudimentary drawings here. So a temporary bridge on the upstream side would come very, very close to this garage here or this house. Um, it would also have additional impacts to this hazardous site right here and hazardous contamination once you get into it and, and digging up dirt and everything, it can get, it can get very expensive uh, pretty quickly. And the other side, a downstream temporary bridge, we really wanted to avoid, um, so we have a utility pole right here. 
And also this telephone pedestal, like I said, this is like a pretty substantial, um, a pretty substantial utility pedestal right here. So we, we did want to avoid that. Also, you know, a lot of times when we're putting in like a full bridge, um, we can kind of justify the costs of a temporary bridge um, because we're getting, you know, a 75 year design life project. When we're looking at a deck replacement, which is a less expensive project, it can be constructed faster, it's a quicker project, then, you know, the closures start, start being more appealing. What suggestions do you have, Laura, then, as far as the, um, the fire department being on one side of the bridge on the east side, and if there's a fire on the west side and it's going to take us 25 minutes longer to get to a fire? Yeah, sure. That's a concern that a lot of towns have. Um, there's some ways around it. Um, some towns have elected to park if you have an extra an extra vehicle on the other side of the bridge. Um, so there is a, a vehicle, a fire truck or what have you. I'm not sure what what the town of Fairfield has um, in their inventory, but you can park another vehicle on the other side of the bridge in case there's an emergency. Um, also mutual aid from uh, I believe it would be Fletcher, St. Albans. Um, so there is there's an opportunity for for mutual aid from from neighboring towns. What what is the overall increase in cost of doing a bank for your bridge? So. So if we look at a temporary bridge, 1.2 million versus, you know, about 1.1 million with this accelerated uh, construction techniques. If we were to do a cast in place, a cast in place deck, and these durations aren't correct, sorry, they weren't in my official presentation, so I didn't look them over. Um, if we were to do a traditional cast in place deck, which would have about a 40 day closure, it would be about 780,000. Um, but it's, it's just as much the impacts to utilities, the impacts to those hazardous waste, the right of way, getting this through the right of way process. So the existing condition of the bridge is something else that we're worried about. So when we do need to get right of way, that easily adds two years onto a project development process. And so, you know, we really want to get this project through through our project development process as quickly as possible. So there are some financial incentives to the town. Um, I know there is that that local bypass route, and a lot of towns, you know, they're worried about wear and tear to their local bypass routes. Um, you know, enforcement on the local bypass route. So we do have something um, called the local bypass mitigation grant. And with that grant, um, towns are, they're given a small, a small grant, small stipend for, you know, dust control, maybe it's uh, speed reductions. Um, and that's based on, you know, the type of road that the local bypass is, the length of the closure, the distance. Um, driven. So that is something that if the town's interested in for maintenance of that local bypass route. Now that won't be a signed route, but, but we do acknowledge that that is something that locals are going to drive. Well, by the amount of cost to, the, to our select board's budget for the no, they, control? They give, you, they give you a grant, 100%. A grant? Yep. I think it's more about the, the fact of the safety and being able to get to either an accident or a fire in a timely manner is the biggest concern. Not to mention in the middle of summer. I mean, depending on what day, what days it is in the middle of summer, the amount of uh, speed trucks that probably go down this road in one day. 
you know, that's not due to safety, but more convenience. But yeah. I, I think my, my biggest concern is the being able to get to an accident or fire in a timely manner. Yep, and I think that's definitely a valid concern. Um, so right now we're starting with a 21 day closure. There, there are things that we can do to reduce that 21 days. I don't see that being any less than 14 days. Um, but if we could you know, close the bridge to one lane alternating for just a week before, before to do some of the demo work, maybe do some railing work, um, some prep work to the beams, it's possible that we can reduce that. Um, and we can certainly look into it as we develop our construction schedules. Um, but I mean, 14 days, I think would be the absolute uh, minimum here. So uh, the only other question I have, Laura, is we're we're certain that this is going to happen in the summer because there is a likelihood that we're going to have to move some fire trucks. And if we get into the fall on this thing, these these trucks can't sit outside in the cold, um, especially as we get into you know mid to late fall, just due to concerns with freezing. So you're, I'm hearing you say summer, and that's that's 100% accurate. Yeah, so our, our typical construction season, it starts April 15th and it runs through October. Um, and so when I do say summer, yes, it's summer anytime between April 15th and through October. And that's something that the state would work, work with the town on, that timing of the closure. So I know there is a lot of farms located in the area. So it could be that we wait till, you know, the first cut of the season. Uh, for haying, and then we go out and close the bridge. Um, so we can definitely work with the town if you want it to happen. So I, I assume that this is a school bus route for school buses in the area. A lot of towns want want their closures to happen so it doesn't um, affect the school bus routes. Um, but really, any time between that April and October date, um, we're open we're open to working with the town on, on that timing. 16 houses on the other, 16 houses on the other side of the river from now. Can you hear you? Sorry, I didn't hear that. There's 16 houses on the other side of the bridge that we deliver mail to. Yep, and so again, like the fire department, um, I assume this is the post office speaking. Um, like the fire department, it's there's an option to maybe either park a car on the other side or take the local bypass route, find a way around. It is going to be, you know, 21 days. Yes. Sorry, someone was going to say something. Uh, yeah, this is Dave. Laura, how how realistic do you think, honestly, a 14 to 21 day closure is? Oh, yeah, it's very realistic. Um, we Our accelerated bridge program has been, been around since 2012, really after Irene, when all those bridges were washed out. We had to replace bridges, you know, really really quickly. Um, we've done full bridge replacements in in 21 days. Now, the, this isn't the location here that that's possible, um, just because of the design features there. But we're, um, we're very confident in that 21 days. Okay. Um, another question for you, our local route that we're, most people are going to use has another bridge that's in very poor condition. Is that something you guys have looked at and you're okay with that? So I guess I'm not exactly sure which bridge, um, which bridge you're referring to. If there is a bridge on that local bypass route that is in poor condition, um, if there's another local bypass route that the town would like to promote, you know, we can give, we can, we can give that um, that grant money 
towards that route. Um, also, part of that money could be used for, I don't know if it's if it's the bridge rail that's wrong on that, that's the issue with the bridge or if it's the condition ratings. I think it's on one of the uh, lists of bridges to be replaced very soon. It's in very- okay, Which one is that? Chester uh, Arthur. Chester Arthur. I'm just worried that we get into a project and find out that excess traffic on that bridge may uh, cause it to be closed down. I'll make note of that. Yeah, I was unaware of that bridge, but I mean, we're we're not proposing that that cars go on the local bypass route. This is just it's it's local traffic, passenger cars. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. We did just have another town-owned uh, structure in Fairfield programmed. And I'm curious, it is a town, a town owned structure. I'm curious if it's the bridge that you're that you're referring to. I don't remember what bridge number it is that was just programmed, but Pro, I mean we received a, a letter from the bridge department on was it parody? Yes. Parody Road, um, that we had to make some replacements on. And oh yes, we uh, Chester Arthur was on the accelerated, we got denied uh, midsummer. Okay. And alternating traffic on this existing bridge when fixing it is, is definitely out of the picture. Yeah, based on the existing deck um, condition, we were worried about we were worried about saw cutting it in half. Also, it's it's a six beam bridge. When we have five beams, it's a little easier. When we have that sixth beam, it's it's hard to work out the geometry there with maintaining traffic. We also weren't confident that we could get a 12 foot uh, a 12 foot width maintained. We're worried about uh, farming traffic going over. Uh, phase construction could be an 11 foot width lane, which is substandard for what we like to provide. Are there any other comments, questions for Laura? If they paint those I beams, they should, they're going to paint the I beams, is that going to be Vermonters doing that? Is that going to be a company out of New Hampshire doing it? They did the bridge down on the in, over the interstate that took uh, an extra month and a half to do. Did you catch that, Laura? I heard something about painting I beams. Um, so we're not we're not proposing painting the I beams here. It's just we're leaving the existing beams as is. There's going to be some cleaning on the top of, of the beams, um, but we, we're not proposing painting them here. Thank you. Yep. When do you need uh, the select board's decision or the town's decision on this? Yeah, so this is, this is a state-owned bridge, so we're really, we're not waiting for a decision from you. It's, there's no town funding here. Um, this is really, this is a concerns meeting. We wanna hear your concerns. So um, as we move forward into the design, the, the design phase, we can take those concerns into consideration. So do you happen to know is Town Highway 29, is that the bridge where, um, that was where there was that was the parody road one. Parody, town highway one. Okay, because we do we do have a town highway bridge that was just programmed, bridge number 49. 
on Town Highway 29. So that one has been accepted into the Town Highway Bridge Program. Um, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head, but I believe that was the Parity Road one, um, which I had reached out and we were told that it didn't make the program as of this summer. So did things change since then or? Um, there was one that was, if this bridge was just um, authorized for funding on the 19th. So a couple days ago. Oh, okay. Uh, so soon that we haven't even had the chance to reach out to you yet. Awesome. <laughs> so we'll be in contact about that one. Thanks, Laura. Yep. Any other questions for Laura while we have her here? That's the one on Chester Arthur. Mm -hmm. Bridge 51 on Town Highway 2 is the Chester Arthur Bridge. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the only the only thing I can suggest with that is just keep uh, keep promoting it, keep bringing it up to the regional, uh, the RPC, um, and just keep making a push for it. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? So I was, you were saying 2,000 cars a day go down 36 here. How many do you estimate will take the uh, the uh, route around 108 versus the route right here in town. Because that, that bridge that's on Chester Arthur Road is just, just a one way bridge, or er, not a one way bridge, but a one lane bridge. So if you start yes. 100 cars an hour, 200. Oh, yeah, I mean, depending on which way they're going, but you know, say so you split in half, 100. Yeah. That's a lot of people putting a lot of people on a blind corner and a blind corner grid. And then the question I have too, Laura, is how is the mitigation bypass grant award amount determined? Um, is that based on the number of cars or the length of the local detour or what's the criteria for determining that? Yep, both of those. So it's based on the, uh, the class of town highway. So, you know, class two gets class two versus class three. Um, it's based on the length and the duration of the detour or the, the length of the local bypass route, the duration of, of the closure. Um, you know, it's based on gravel versus paved. Um, the number of cars per day. Um, it's not, you know, it's, you know, it could be like a couple thousand dollars. Thank you. Yep. Um, so in terms of how many cars are going to drive that, sorry, I missed that question. Uh, so the 2000 cars a day, that's the out year, that's our design year, ADT. A little bit less right now. It's 1,800 vehicles per day. Um, certainly, trucks. We do not want trucks taking that route. Um, you know, on on either side of where this detour starts, on either end of Vermont Route 36. You know, I think this is a good location for you know some extra PCMS boards. We really want to do some outreach to the trucking community, make sure they're not um, coming up to the bridge. Um, and in terms of the local bypass route, uh, we don't sign that, we don't promote it. It's it's just however many locals know about it. So Laura, Laura, it might make sense, uh, you know, with that bridge being set up the way it is, um, if there's room in that local grant to put up some signaling there, because with the volume of traffic flow that we're gonna have, especially you know, in the morning hours on the way to on the way to work and in the afternoon on the way from work, we may want to have some signaling set up there just so you know we don't we can avoid maybe long lines and, and everybody knows what's going on. I think it would make it a lot safer. That's a good idea. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I think that's I think that's a great suggestion. Um I'm not sure if we'd be able to pay for that as part of the project using the federal funding. Rob Young is on the line. It looks like you might know better. Uh, yes. Uh, so 
So the, tra the traffic light you're talking at the beginning and end of the local bypass route? There's a, a narrow bridge on the, on the bypass route. So it's basically an alternating one-way bridge. Uh, okay. I see. So a light along that route. Yeah, that, that could be part of the grant. We could maybe have to look more into it, but maybe that'd be part of the funding with, included with the grant. So that would be additional funds that we would give to the town and they would have to pursue getting the yeah, light. Yeah, if, it, if it's on a town road, it would probably be uh, the town decision to, to put that light up. But we could talk into the, um, you know, we could look at that when we um, calculate the grant. Okay. We can do that with the local grant fund that they give us. We could, we could contract. <laughs> So are there any other questions or comments? I guess I have just one final one. If we're interested, I mean, we're certainly interested in, in obtaining a, a bypass mitigation grant from VTrans. Is that something that we need to reach out to Jim Cota for, or does that go through you? Or what does that process look like for obtaining that? Yeah, so Rob Young is gonna be the design project manager. Um, and that would be worked out through, through Rob Young, I believe. Yeah, so we would just work with you folks once we have a contractor on board. I mean, you know, the project is is you know financed and it's it's good to go. Um, it's really a, pro a process that I would initiate, and, and you know, I'll just get that going uh, once we have a contractor. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll have another meeting. I mean, this is kind of like the first meeting, but we'll have another meeting. Um, you know, once we have all the final plans, um, you know, before we advertise this out, so you go, folks can look at all the details of the plans. And you know we'll have the you know local bypass could come up again by that point. It probably would be out of every. <clears throat> this will be like a year before construction, so you'll have you have time to to um, discuss it before then. Laura, I just got a quick point, Laura and Rob. So we did a project and we ended up with a local route, um, a little bit towards St. Albans, and the, the traffic on the on the project tended to drive pretty fast. It got pretty dusty, so. This, this grant is pretty worthy. Would it be helpful if they, or do you realize they're gonna have to have sheriffs out there patrolling some at some point to control the speed of traffic that doesn't normally hit that road and, and the dust control, do you, do you guys already have that cost? Yep, enforcement. Yep, that's all part of that grant. Okay. It, it takes into consideration dust control costs it can be used towards enforcement. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, they might even put up some signs if they wanted to, right? Like local traffic only to kind of deter. Probably their biggest challenge is going to be all the firms right there trying to figure out how to get around for those few weeks. Yeah, so again, that's that timing thing. It's yeah. the closure can happen right after that first cut. And yes, yep. glad you're here, though. Well, we're going to get that bridge replaced. Needs it. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Any final questions for Laura? Not seeing any. Well, thank you all for your time, Laura um, and Rob and Jim and folks that came out for this presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. Laura. Yes, I can reclaim in here. I'm now the host. I'm going to mute all. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, without anything further, we'll move on to the kind of the last little public information hearing. Um, I will turn this over to Emily. Sure. Hi. And I believe um, Julie from the community center is here as well. 
Um, so uh, Julie, do you want to give the brief overview of the project? Oh, hang on, I have to. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we were made aware of um, uh, COVID or CARES funding through Vermont Community Development Project or program. Um, the Fairfield Community Center was made aware of, uh, of funds. Um, and we um, have a project which hope we hope will help us um, serve the people in need more. Um, and it is building a pavilion. We're calling it a pavilion. So it's a, a structure um, behind the garden beds to the west of the community center on the green space. Um, it would be a post and beam structure um, roofed and on a slab. Um, and so Emily's been helping us put together an application um, for this project. Um, and we see that it would benefit our youth programs, our food shelf and our senior meals um, and have other uses after um, COVID passes, um, particularly for community events, um, run for chat. Um, the setup for that would be so much easier if there was a structure there um, for the rec department to set up in. Um, so that's sort of an overview of what we're proposing. And Emily maybe can talk about kind of the grant and all the requirements of it. Yeah, hi. So the grant is um, a VCP Vermont Community Development Program, which is uh, part of the Agency of Commerce Community Development. Um, and it's specific um, money that they set aside for coronavirus assistance and relief fund. Um, so unlike a normal project with them, there's no grant match. So it's 100% grant. Um, and it's designed for projects that help um, respond to or recover from COVID. So this project would help um, the community center uh, deal with uh, the COVID restrictions by allowing them to have a structure that they can actually use um, to host their programs and to host their senior meals safely as we move into the summer. Um, and we're still kind of waiting for some of the restrictions to uh, lift up as we um, get people vaccinated. So it's a great opportunity for the town because it's a 100% grant match, um, but it would be the town applying. So the way the structure of the program works is that um, the town applies and um, we're not sure getting clarification from VCDP if it would be the community center would be an official sub grantee or if the community center would just be kind of like a community partner, but not in that official sub grantee role. And what do we need from this hearing today, Emily? Yeah, so I think what we need from the hearing today is um, the select board approving, uh, moving forward with applying for the grant. Um, and also, uh, Jonathan, I believe I sent you the letter, the municipal letter, which essentially states that the project is uh, conforming with the goals of the regional plan. Um, I think it's uh, important to note that our budget estimate is still a rough estimate and we're working on getting more detail. Um, there's a possibility that if that um, number comes in at 10% higher than this, that the select board will have to re-approve that budget number. But again, there's no grant match for this. So that doesn't have any effect on like the town's funds. So are there questions from the select board or anyone on this call or Zoom? Dave or Jean, uh, Tom stepped away for a minute. So it's the two of you, or Charlie. No, I don't I don't have any more questions. I think uh, between Emily and Julie, they did a good job presenting and making it clear what they're asking for. Uh, I actually don't have any questions. Yeah, keep us in the loop. Let us know how it's going. I mean, okay. Well, you need us. You need us tonight to approve this, yeah. Emily. Yeah. So to approve um, moving forward with applying and to approve the signing the municipal letter of conformance. Um, okay. Okay. Great. Well, we'll keep you informed as we 
we go along. There's a lot of details still to work out, but. Um, uh, Emily, do you need a motion in the minutes or how, what do you need for a formal approval? Yeah, motion in the minutes would be good. Just motion to approve and to sign the letter. Do you have the letter in front of you, Jonathan? I do not. I did not get a chance to print it out today, but I can print the folks have to come in and sign warrants anyways, so I can have it printed and ready when folks come in. Okay. Um, Great. Do I guess I just like to see the letter before I make a motion or approve anything. So Emily, if I uh, give you permission, do you have it with you? Yes, I can pull it up on share screen. Okay, I made you the host. All right, great. Let me get that up here. Let me open it up in my computer. We had some people trying to come in and fish our thing, so you might have to watch that. Okay. Yes, I will pay attention to see if there's anything. Yeah, I know there can be some issues sometimes with Zoom. That was crazy. <laughs> that was crazy. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know. I, old we live in. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> yeah, so this is the draft letter. Essentially, it uh, states a, a brief description of the project, which is the pavilion to help with the community center programming. Um, and then it states that it's consistent with the plan. Um, and these are um, several of the um, uh, priorities and goals and policies that are in the newly adopted plan that um, kind of match with the project. Um, so all it is is essentially stating the project, not, they, VCDP wants to make sure your project isn't going against your town plan. Um, Short and sweet and straight to the point. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not very controversial, I don't think. No, no, I can agree with you 100% there, 100%. That's good enough for me. Okay. Uh, is that a motion, Charlie? <laughs> I want to wait for Dave, wait for Dave to read it first. Oh, let me pull it back up. Once, once Dave says he's read it and is okay with it, I'll make a motion. Uh, Emily. Dave, Dave says it looks good to him, so I would make a motion to accept this and move forward. What was that, Tom? Can you make it bigger? I cannot. Um, Emily, can you unmute Dave Persons? Oh, yes. Sorry. I forgot I was in charge. <laughs> Okay, I just clicked ask to unmute. It didn't take me that long to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second your motion, Charlie. That looks good to me. Yeah, it looks good. Thank you. Great. Put it to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Well, thank you, Emily and Julie, and let me know. I'll, I'll get the letter printed out and ready for the select board to sign, and as soon as it's signed, I'll get it returned to you both. Okay, thanks for fitting thank us you. in. Yeah, thanks for fitting us in. Bye, Emily. Bye, Julie. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Jonathan, you probably need to, yeah, there you go. Yep, thank you. Tom, back to the regular agenda. I didn't have any any other items. It was just reports and approval of minutes and warrant. You down? Thank you. I see Dave unmuted. Let's see Jean's unmuted.
I don't think they heard you, Tom. I don't know if they did. Can you, you guys? Were, yeah, you were froze up for a minute, Tom. Yeah, the, the internet kind of stuck out for a second. We need a full or comments on the February 8th meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Nobody knows that the generator at the town of Raj, right? That's not a, that's still, we're still waiting for that, right? Yes, we're looking at an April 1st. So there's not really parts we're waiting for. We're just waiting for a whole new generator, right? I think it, well, they're building the generator. Um, so I, I haven't heard any more from Johnson Hardware regarding that. Any other comments or everybody ready to approve it? I'm ready to approve, Tom. So we need a motion. Did. Did. I'll make it. Okay. All of the February 8th meeting. All right. How about February 12th? That was the that was uh the special, right? That was the three o'clock meeting. I did that. Did it was. Let me look at that real quick. Yeah. Hey, I, I think it went pretty well considering. It died uh, and then it came back. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, it froze. That's what it was. It froze. Were you able to read them, Charlie? Yeah, yeah, looks good to me. We need a motion to approve them. I will make that motion. Second. Thank you, I don't know if that's Jonathan or Melissa, but. Dave said yes. I will second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I guess, I guess I only have one comment. Out of those minutes, the conversation that was supposed to happen has not taken place yet. Right. Correct. So I don't know if we there's a time that we want to reschedule. Um, I have processed one payroll. Um, based on the minutes that you just approved. Um, and I, I haven't had any comments regarding it yet, but I'm sure I will. Um, so I don't know when we would like to do that, probably sooner rather than later. Uh, I, I believe, um, just let me know, but I think um, Tom or Gavin should be present as well. I agree with that. I don't either, Charlie or I is fine, but I would like to see Tom or Gavin as well. So Tom, I, I know Gavin's like home quarantining. Um, is there a time that works better for you? Tomorrow morning? Not tomorrow, Wednesday? Thursday? Okay. No, it's fine. Yeah. I just. Uh, uh, it's going to be dragged on weather too. It, it is. I agree. I just. We, we probably shouldn't let it drag out too right. long. Right. Agreed. And it probably should be you, Charlie, because I'm probably going into a quarantine as well. Yeah, I'll be back from. Um, I'll be back from work Wednesday evening, first thing Thursday, I believe. I'm not quite certain yet, but um, I should be available towards the end of the okay. week. Thursday, Friday, Sunday. Okay, so Thursday. It's going to snow for the end of time. So, so tentatively, th th Thursday or Friday? Yes, Friday. sir. So, 
Um, the only thing that I have to report on, and I think I mentioned this to Gene this morning, so VTrans has issued their um, town highway structures program and their class two town highway paving program. Um, we have five class two town highways in Fairfield, North Road, South Road, Buck Hollow, Pond, Sheldon Woods, Swamp. and Swamp up until St. Pierre. Um, so certainly, you know, those are due the first two weeks in April. So between now and the next couple of weeks, um, and I've already mentioned this to Mo as well, you know, let's start thinking of which one of those roads we should put in an application for, um, as well as the structures program. Uh, we used the last structures program that we applied for was 2018. And we actually just did the construction this summer for the culvert on South Road. Um, so, you know, what is the next structure in Fairfield that we think needs addressing? Um, the grant is only about 200,000. So it, it can't be a substantial project, but, um, you know, certainly something that we, that we might like to address. Again, no decision has to be made tonight, but I would just encourage the select board um, to think about this um, in the next month or so. 10-4. Can you put that on an agenda and we talk to Mo about condition of said roads? Verts and whatnot in those areas? Yes, I, I will add it to the next agenda. That, that's all I have in my report, Tom. No more, I so. No more. We can't really approve the warrants because they're not. Correct. So we have a payroll warrant and an AP warrant here. I don't know. Um, you know, Tom's the only one here in person. So how we want to go about um, doing the warrants. Um, thoughts from the select board. Say that again, Jonathan, please. I think if I remember before that there can be a conditional approval. Okay. And then they'll just come and, and then review they them. come and look at them. Okay. And then it has to be ratified at the next the meeting. Next meeting. Yeah. Okay. I think that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah, we just we have warrants here. Um that and Tom's the only one here in person. Um okay. so how, you know the, what's the best way to go about approving these? Um and Melissa just mentioned conditionally approving them tonight, um, but have each select board member come in and, and review and then ratifying that at the next meeting. Okay. That works for me. Gene looks like his microphone disappeared, so I can't unmute. He's um, probably that one, 933. This 933? Yeah. But do you need a motion to conditionally approve the warrants? Yes, both the payroll and the accounts payable. Okay, since we can't all be there, let's make a motion to conditionally approve them and uh, we'll review them when we come in to sign them this week. And oh, no, 5865, the other one. Give that a try, Jean. Charlie, you gonna second that? Start. Yep, yeah, I'll second. I'll second. Can you hear me now? Well, let's start the meeting over. Jean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> did you have a comment? I. No, I'm good. All those in favor of doing it as, as stated, uh, say aye. 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 Yeah. Unless anyone else has anything. Any other comments from you guys or questions? No, I think I've had enough. Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>